Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Carsey Mitzner, and I am the chair of the Future Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to the LBJ Library. And for those of you who are not members of the Future Forum, I just wanted to briefly tell you that we are a bipartisan public policy discussion forum, and we'd really encourage you to join. And um, if you have any questions about our membership, we have a table over here with our upcoming events, and you can ask anyone with a little name tag on. That's going to be a board member who will be able to tell you what all we are about. And um, just to let you know, our next event is a members-only tree lighting party. And we'll have an after party at the Townsend, which will be really fun, on December 3rd. And we have events coming up next year, a New Year happy hour, a Future of Texas event with discussion with uh, legislators about the upcoming session. We'll have a national security event and a women in leadership event. So I really hope to see all of you at those events. And um, for now, I'm going to hand it over to our board member and the Texas Tribune's editor-in-chief, Emily Ramshaw. Hi, I'm Emily Ramshaw, uh, as Carsey said, the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. Uh, and although the Future Forum is a bipartisan group, uh, I've brought you a uh, fleet of conservatives here who had pretty disparate views on this last uh, presidential cycle. They are here to forecast the future of the GOP for you this evening. Uh, I'd love to introduce them. On the right is Erica Greeter, conservative writer and author of the Texas tome, Big Hot, Cheap and Right. Next are is Temo Muñiz, the chairman of the Federation of Hispanic Republicans, and he was on Jeb, exclamation points, Texas leadership team. <laughs> Deirdre DeLisi is a GOP political consultant and longtime advisor to former Governor Rick Perry. And Jason Johnson is a political operative, and he was the chief strategist for Senator Ted Cruz's presidential bid. Uh, so as we were planning this conversation, I really thought we were going to be taking a different approach. I actually thought we were... <laughs> yes, I know, the media and everyone else got it wrong. Um, I thought we were going to be having a conversation about you know, how the GOP was able to rebuild itself after this very historic election. It has turned out to be a historic election for a very different reason. I mean, I, I'd like for my first question to be, what the hell? But I think, <laughs> I think my first question should actually be, you know, how, how do you all look at, at the party going forward? Uh, how do you think the Texas GOP fits into this equation? Uh, I mean, when you're looking at Washington right now, you know, how, how does the Republican Party that you all are familiar with, acquainted with, sort of recalibrate after this election? And anybody who wants to jump in, Jason, why don't you kick us off? Oh, boy. Yep. <laughs> you're wearing your elephant tie. So. Yeah, it was 12, 1250 at Nordstrom, right? <laughs> this, this event. So, yeah, I, I agree, you know, that when we first visited about this, I was one of those who thought the world would look a little different, uh, though there were some conflicts in my mind we can maybe discuss at another point. Uh, but, you know, I think the, 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 the way I have thought about this, even before Trump, is that there are a lot of people who were already very, you know, quote, concerned about the future of the Republican Party. Go back to 2012. Uh, when President Obama was reelected, the whole aut autopsy coming out, uh, the demographic changes, the, the historical lack of appeal, right? And so I think all of that was true before last week, and it remains true today. It's just there are some more unique challenges uh, that we may face going forward. Uh, the, other, the other issue uh, that I thought more and more about, particularly since May, is if you know, there are a lot of people who are saying that the Republican Party is dead, for example. I hear that a lot. Is the Republican Party dead? And if you step back and, and look outside of when they are in the House, they're in the Senate or in the White House, and just think about presidential elections and the historic role that parties have played in that nominating process, I think it's fair that a lot of people have criticized what role the you know, traditional opinion leaders did or did not play. Uh, there, people can have you know, reasonable arguments on, on both sides of that equation. However, from my perspective, when I think about this primary cycle and everything that occurred, frankly, it did prove that, as you know, one book that's been written, the party does decide. Mm -hmm. And it did decide. Uh, in some cases, you know, people always talk about endorsements. A lack of endorsements or a lack of 
a, a rejection, if you will, was in and of itself an endorsement uh, of the ultimate nominee. So, I mean, go forward. I think all of the challenges that existed before exist today. That's without knowing anything that may unfold once uh, President-elect Trump uh, is inaugurated. Uh, but, you know, I, I think so much will be determined in the next 12 months starting in January. I mean, Deirdre, is, is Trump emblematic of, of any of the Republicans you know or of the Republican values that, I mean, you, now you did vote for him in the end. I did, I voted for him. Mm -hmm. I, he's an anomaly. He's been an anomaly this entire election cycle from the moment he declared in Trump Tower that he was gonna run for president. And his whole campaign has been completely atypical. I don't look at him in the sense of a conservative. I see him as a populist. And, you know, I think, as Jason said, we don't really know how this is gonna play out at this point. We, there's a couple of indications that we're gonna watch for. Who is he gonna surround himself in the White House? Who is he gonna to appoint to key cabinet positions? And what's his relationship gonna be with, with Congress? Um, you know, I think Donald Trump had a luxury in this, in this campaign cycle that traditional politicians don't have, which is he's never done this before, right? And so he was able, as I like to say, he was able to write checks with his mouth that he can't cash. A traditional politician says, okay, I can't, you can't say you're going to build a wall across the whole Mexican border. That's impossible. Forget the policy implications. It's just not feasible. He was never constrained by that. And people responded to it like, oh, it's a fresh, breath of fresh air. This is so different than a traditional politician. Um, so it's going to be interesting to me to see how people respond to what he is able to accomplish, particularly in the next 12 to 18 months, in the lead up to the next midterms. Um, and I think that, to go back to your original question, I think that has some significant implications for what's gonna happen in Texas. I mean, never in a million years did I think on election night, Donald Trump was gonna do better in Ohio than he did in Texas. Mm -hmm. We saw some real fissures in the Republican Party in Texas. We saw some urban problems really magnify. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think I think 18 could be a potentially a very interesting year in Texas as well as nationally, depending on how Trump responds to the challenge of leadership and governing in the next year or so. Tamo, I'm looking at the primary process this time around, did the Republican Party lose control of itself? I mean, you know, Jason was talking about were we the you know party that we wanted to be? The party, the Republican Party, in the end, determined what it wanted to be. Did you all lose control? You know, I uh, personally called for the head of Reince Priebus, uh, you know, on BuzzFeed. <laughs> And that really got me in trouble, a lot of uh, big timers in the GOP. But, You're not going to have uh, any friends in the White House. Yeah, I won't, uh, but we'll be all right. They're going to they're gonna need, yeah. need us. But, uh, the, you know, looking at the, where the GOP is at uh, in the primary process, um, I think we, we have a lot of room for, for improvement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I agree. You know, it depends on what Trump does in the future, uh, especially when it comes, and I'm, that's all I'm about at this point, is Texas, where we're going to the future when it comes to the Hispanic vote. Uh, you know, I'm a grassroots guy. I started out supporting Alan Keyes and built my way up to supporting Jeb at the national level. And I'm looking at Harris County, for example, where I'm from. And, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, we lost it by 160,000 votes, you know. And I, I'm watching all the party leaders, uh, including Paul Simpson and these guys, discussing on, uh, you know, between us, what happened? They're all like, what's going on? What's happened? Well, you know, I ran Gilbert Pena's race in House District 144. And in 2012, uh, we, you know, we lost by six points. In 14, we won by 152 votes against an incumbent. Uh, she had a quarter of a million dollars. We only had $13,000, and we won because of grassroots. And now we got blown out by 21 points. 34% increase in the Hispanic community, uh, Democrat voters, 34% increase. This is a 75% Hispanic district. That's what Republicans need to pay attention to coming into the future when Texas goes from 16 points to nine points. Uh, I look at California, and, and as a proud Republican conservative, I'm worried that we're coming across the same trends in Texas. And already, you know, I was asked about Trump and Hispanic outreach, and I said, look, I think to the future, if Trump doesn't do a good job when it comes to uh, immigration, uh, I think future, the future leaders who are running 10 years from now are going to be asked whether they supported Trump or not. And already, the chair, a good friend of mine, Tom Meckler, uh, chairman, said, well, uh, you know, I think we're doing well with minorities. That's the problem right there, that we, we really got to pay attention to what's happening in Texas. And when you have party brass, you have uh, donors, you got leaders who don't pay, pay attention to what happened in California, and it's slowly happening in Texas, 
uh, as a conservative, it, that's what keeps me up at night, so. Can I, can I just say one thing as the old timer in this group? I can't believe I can say that. <laughs> I just did my no, first presidential felt. campaign in 1996. Uh, and I did one in 2000 and 2012, and thank God I wasn't involved in this one. It, to go, the process has become crazy. The process is out of control. I, start, I saw it starting in 2012 with this sort, the irony of it, we called it at the time, the sort of reality TV show approach to nominate. It was like American Idol meets Survivor, and that was carried into this. You're not gonna make a Dancing with no, the Stars reference? I'm not gonna make a Dancing with the Stars. Although, let's <sighs> yeah. have a dance off. Um, you know, and it was sort of carried into the cycle. I mean, seeing how we used, you know, you know, the, the 96 process and the 2000 process with very serious-minded approach to talking about policy and talking about issues and what defines each candidate is like completely out of the, out the window. And I think ultimately it, it hurts us as a party. I mean, you know, what are we becoming when our debates become these discussions of hand size? And I don't think that... There's no problem. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, believe just, no I mean, problem. just to verify that, yeah, no on Red State today, <laughs> Right on Red State today, uh, they were talking about Kanye West running for uh, for president in 2020, right. Right. and uh, Red State, a contributor who's a conservative, wrote, "Now it's possible because mm -hmm. of what happened with Trump." Well, I mean, y'all are acting pretty calm for people. Uh, Ted Cruz called Trump a narcissist and a pathological liar. Rick Perry called him a cancer on conservative uh, conservatism. Uh, we all know the like unbelievably horrific things Trump has said about women and minorities. I mean, Erica. How, how does the party get behind, then, somebody who's, who's you know, peddled these kinds of wares? I, that is a question I uh, am not qualified to ask, because I cannot imagine how anybody got behind this, this candidate. Um, especially from a conservative point of view, I mean, e even, setting aside, even setting aside the xenophobia, the bigotry, the misogyny, um, there's the fact that he's, for example, against NAFTA. Um, if he proceeds with those plans, that would be catastrophically bad for Texas. It would be a huge disruption. It would be wrenching. I was looking at some some data from Houston today. Um, Houston was already at risk of slipping into a regional recession, uh, which could bring the state into recession, when we were all assuming that Clinton would win. Um, now, you think about how, how leveraged that city is. I mean, how much investment they put into infrastructure for the expansion of the Panama Canal and so on. I mean, if, if we are going to a more protectionist stance, that is going to be horrible for Texas um, and for the Texas Republican Party. Um, looking at this campaign, which I covered, uh, from August, after we finished the last session, kind of did best and worst and wrapped it up. I, I recognize Trump early on as a, as a variety of a phenomenon we've seen before in Texas. You know, the sort of conservative who comes and casts himself as an outsider, speaking truth to power, and, um, you know, standing up to the powerful interests, the elites, the establishments, the media. Um, and, and, you know, it's a kind of, uh, I got very alarmed about it back last August, just because I've seen this playbook before. Um, and you know, it works because you sort of, when you say that you're speaking truth to power, and power includes like the media, the fourth state, um, and people in your party, and on the other side of the aisle, then you're making a kind of non-falsifiable claim, and anything that like the fourth state says back is taken as proof that, oh, see, they're criticizing me, I, I told you, they're out to get me, they're out to get me. So there's this kind of, you know, you become in this sort of fact-free zone where you can, um, make whatever claims you want. In Trump's case, often very ugly claims, very divisive, very polarizing claims. Um, I think it was sort of, uh, in a sense, like a, a freak accident that's happened. Um, I mean, he's been threatening for president for, what, 30 years, and now he finally did it. Um, it was a crowded field. I haven't covered Senator Cruz closely since he was first elected to the Senate. Um, I felt that given the mood of the electorate, the anger at the establishment, the anger at the elites, um, after eight years of a Democratic president, you often see a shift to the other party. Um, I thought it was going to be either he or Cruz in the end, um, but the primary just dragged on so long uh, with you know, Rubio staying in the race, Kasich staying in the race, um, that by the time people realized that he had been the front runner all this time, the field was so split, um, it was too late to stop him. Um, and then at that point, you have two major parties in a country, and he was one of their nominees. So that's why he won. So in that sense, I don't think it tells us anything dispositive about the American character or even the Republican voter's character. I wouldn't judge like, a Trump voter for having voted for Trump so dear we can still be friends if you want to. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, and he was their nominee. I mean, so if he, wasn't, if he wasn't okay, why would he be the nominee in the first place? Um, but now, I mean, you have this, this, sort of, this, this sort of 
nationwide gaslighting where we're all kind of expected to just move on, like we didn't see this happen, like, and we didn't hear this happen, and we didn't hear all these ugly things. And uh, I think the Republican leaders would like to do that, would like to kind of treat him as though he's a normal president. And as an American, I pray that he will do well. I, I'm rooting for him to succeed. Um, but I'm not gonna tell anybody that they didn't just hear a year and a half of abuse from somebody who's now president-elect. Um, I've had friends call me in tears this week, and like I've had a busy week too, but like my friends call me in tears. Um, just, just you know, feeling unsafe, unwelcome in their own country. My dad's an immigrant. I, I wonder if he feels unwelcome in his own country now. Um, and so I think that that I'm not sure if there's a way to um, for those wounds to be acknowledged. But I think them not being acknowledged is going to make it hard for us to move on. It corrodes our trust in each other and ourselves. Um, plus, at the policy level, you now have a president who's a populist nationalist. Uh, and a Speaker of the House, uh, Paul Ryan, who's a conservative in the same sense I am, like a, a classical liberal. Um, so, it's, I mean, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for eight years. I'm curious, what did we learn about the Republican Party in Texas via this election? I mean, obviously, the margin in Texas was not nearly as wide as it was some other places. I mean, are we seeing the same sort of populist streak? Is it muted here? Was there more concern among Hispanic voters, maybe more concern among, among women? What, what did we learn about Texas this cycle? The urban communities? I mean, are there, are there red flags for you? Are there, are there symbols? I mean, the urban vote is what's the most concerning to me. I mean, you, every major urban area outside of, uh, outside of Tarrant County is solidly voting Democrat now. Now, it's in a presidential election. You may not see that. You don't see that same kind of turnout in a gubernatorial year. But, you know, the trend, that plus Trump getting, what, 8.5% vote, of the vote, uh, or winning by an 8.5% margin down from Romney's 16 and McCain's 12, you know, that's concerning. Um, and, um, you, you, you know, it, it makes you think that, it makes me concerned that if there was a Democrat, if the Democrat Party could ever manage to find a candidate who could be somewhat credible in suburban Texas, they would have a fighting ch chance. And, and I do believe this. They could have a chance in 2018, depending on what happens in Washington, and, conf and, and also what happens in Austin. We're going to be in a difficult legislative session. And if you have two bad situations going on at once, there could be a shot. I think it's a long shot, but you know, I think there's a reason. I don't think Republicans in Texas should be sitting back going, everything's great. This is not 2000, 2002. What do you think about that, Jason? I agree, and in, in, I think it's even worse, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, because here, what I, here's the way I process Texas, All right? So, I, I genuinely believe, and the truth of the matter is, I, I did throughout the entire election, I just couldn't bring myself to, to accept it uh, through the summer as certain things unfolded, and frankly, things, none of them were surprised because different versions of all of those things had happened. But you look at Texas, and 2016 was a year when the Republican was going to win. You said most of the time since the 22nd Amendment, it's only happened once that we've given the White House to the same party three terms in a row. It was going to happen. And so then you look at Texas and say, but wait, in Texas, the margin closed. So, okay, what is it about Trump? What is it about her? But I think if you then look out to the other states, I think the answer, and Eric, you said another thing. You said, I don't view people who voted for Trump or at large as this is you know, some reflection of our character you know, at large. Uh, that's something I've struggled with, but I agree in the end. The real issue, I believe, is here in Texas, as we know, and a lot of great work you guys did in the past, the economy. And... This, I, I believe this is an oversimplification, but it's the way I've been thinking about it. Why did I have uh, so much time and feel so burdened and the responsibility to think about what a Trump candidacy means for our culture, for our parties, uh, for my children, et cetera? Well, let's just be frank, because I have that time and I'm blessed economically. And I think for those of us 
And it's not to say you don't think about those things if you're worried about your job or et cetera, but here in Texas, there are more of us that don't worry as much about putting food on the table, if you will, and as such, that gives you, it's, it's, it's much more realistic and, and a, a priority to say, wait a second, I'm not okay with that, because I'm not. But if you're in Michigan, or you're in Pennsylvania, in and, and a, and a part of the country that's been left behind, I don't believe the vast majority of those people were okay with it either. But they, they, they made a choice. Mm -hmm. They said, I can't go on. My children can't go on. My grandchildren won't have opportunity if we continue, whether they're right or wrong, if we continue with these policies. And so I think that's a part yeah. of the, of the yeah. gap. And frankly, personally, it's encouraging to me, yeah. right? Yeah. Because people step back and say, you know what, I'm not going to vote. Or I know people who said, I'll vote straight ticket because I can't. I didn't vote. At all. I, I voted, but I skipped the presidential. And, and, but I'll be very honest about it. I mean, it's like, well, gee, what a sacrifice. You're in Texas. You know he's going to win. And, and I, you know, in July, I think it, it was after the convention, I started thinking more about if I were in Florida, if I were in Pennsylvania. And every time I landed on no because I'm not okay with this but it was always lingering and I always struggled with it. And I, I think that happened by and large because you're like, you know, I don't like the way he talks. I sure as heck don't like it if he actually did these things. But for me and my family, I can't continue with these policies. The post-mortems mortems on this race have been fascinating, particularly when you go into the state-by-state -state analysis. In Wisconsin, I've just been obsessed with because when they called up, you know, I'm sitting there watching TV with my kids, like Hillary Clinton's going to be president, right? And then they called Wisconsin. All of a sudden it was like, uh, I don't know, maybe Donald Trump's going to win this thing. And they've gone back and they're talked to all these voters who are two-time Obama voters in a place like Wisconsin, which Hillary Clinton just didn't even compete in. She lost Literally. it by double digits to Bernie Sanders in the primary and then never once visited the state in the general election. Pulled our advertising money off, the, off of Wisconsin because they were trying to compete in Arizona. They were trying to pick up a random delegate in Nebraska. I mean, these, she was spending in Texas when she wasn't spending yeah. in Wisconsin. Yeah, she was, try, she was spending more time trying to expand her map uh, rather than focusing on, on, the, on the Obama coalition. And, um, you know, these are people who are saying, you know, this, they, NPR did an interview with a woman, a white woman, you know, two-time Obama voter who said, I voted for Trump because he... He's the guy that's going to bring the change. That was all it was about for him, yep. for her. She voted for Obama because she saw him as a change agent and didn't really see too much change and too much opportunity for, for her family. And, and, she, and she said, I voted for Trump because I hope he mixes things up, but I hope he doesn't go too far. Yep. And so I think that is a per, yeah. per, pre, pre, prevalent, prevalent attitude out there. Mm -hmm. Tim, I'm curious, I mean, what does this mean for, for Latino outreach among the Republican Party? I mean, how did this move the needle backward? Uh, what did this do for the quote-unquote sort of sleeping giant? I think it did. Uh, you know, I listened to what Jason's saying. You know, one of the issues I had with Ted Cruz, I told him to, personally, uh, when he ran for Senate, was he raised the issue, legitimized it, legitimized the issue of in-state tuition for illegal kids. Uh, you know, and I, I'm hearing through our own party, that might become an issue here in the legislative session. Once you add that on top of what Trump said during the campaign, uh, it's very difficult to go to Hispanic communities and knock on doors and go on Univision, Telemundo, and sell the GOP. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible. Uh, I invite anybody who's a Republican, I dare them to go to any restaurant or any workplace and just do it anecdotally, you know, from an anecdotal uh, standpoint. Don't, don't, don't look at the polls, just, just try to sell the GOP. And uh, I think we do have an issue we've got to address. But I also agree with De uh, Deidre that, uh, you know, Trump could, could really, uh, you know, the same way he sold the opposite, he can do, he can improve vastly. Uh, I've actually heard a lot of the people I've talked to, pastors and community leaders, Chamber of Commerce guys, they heard from Trump uh, over the weekend from a 60 Minutes interview, uh, a, little, a little bit of hope, like they said. Is he softening? Uh, the guy commands national attention, and he could flip he can change the brand within hours. So, uh, you know, yeah, I'm hoping for a lot from Trump right now. I'm, I'm, I guess, uh, the desperate position, you could, I guess you could say. You're hoping he's unpredictable. Well, yeah, you know, uh, you look at the picks he's doing. Uh, he's, you know, Paul Ryan, uh, 
Ryan Shapiro is guy, the guy uh, he's leaning on. Some of them have great positions on immigration, and then you have other guys like Bannon, and you have uh, you know, Chris Kobach, uh, rumors floating around. I think he's a guy that doesn't have much of a, uh, a grasp on policy, and he allows people to fight in the room for what should be the, the, the ideal position. For me, that's, that's a good thing you know, uh, at this point. Did you uh, vote for him? I did not. I voted for Evan McMullen. Uh, only 659 people did in Harris County. So, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, but again, it was a Mormon guy, a Mormon that led, uh, you know, I grew up evangelical, somebody of God, and I, I hear conservatism, classical liberalism, and it was, uh, I was taught as a child that I, and I, you know, and look, this, we all probably have things in our past like that. I was taught that the Mormons were a cult, and, but it was a Mormon who held the anchor for conservative values. And I voted for the guy because, you know, I, I thought, wow, what, what happened to our conservatism? What happened to the Big Ten approach, compassionate conser conservatism, you know, uh, society of ownership, uh, you know, points of light, all that that brought me to the party. I remember in 2000, uh, we had uh, at the convention, I wasn't there, but I saw a lot of my friends on the, on the old videos on C-SPAN. We had a Mexi famous Mexican mariachi singer named Vicente Fernandez singing Rancho Grande at the, at the national convention. And all the Texas delegates in the very front, because of Bush, were waving their hats and, and singing. You know. And then uh, 16 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm at the convention, and I'm hearing Trump attack NAFTA. Mm -hmm. I got up and left during NAFTA because I'm, I'm from Texas. We're, we're making money in Texas, you know, cash money. And uh, it was kind of strange to see that flip. So from an Hispanic outreach, I'm a grassroots guy, I've run a lot of campaigns, won campaigns, worked on, we have, we have a real issue. And I think we're in a wait and see uh, sort of phase here with Trump to see what he does. Eric, I want to ask you about the Texas legislature getting ready to go into session. You know, obviously a GOP-led legislature. Now we've got a GOP-led Congress. We have a GOP president in theory, and we're going to get a Supreme Court justice, conservative-leaning, we think. Yeah. Maybe Ted Cruz, although that's uh, looking no. less likely. Uh, what does this mean for the legislature? I mean, do they have sort of carte blanche to do whatever they want? Can they act without fear? Can they, you know, pass policies that they don't have to worry about getting overturned? Well, they, they were doing that. Regardless, I mean, there's this sort of oppositional. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I mean, it would be funny, but like, I'm, I think that they're probably. I, I think if you're someone like uh, Greg Abbott or Dan Patrick, in a way, it's better for you to have Obama as the sort of, you know, the kind of constant figure. You're always going against Obama. You're always suing DC and so on. I think about things like the priorities we've heard cited, things like bathroom privacy, women's privacy. You know, that's um, that's not a priority for Trump. So I mean, I guess like they, I. It's not even a priority for the state. I mean, this is a state of 27 million people. We've got more than 5 million kids in public schools. We've got infrastructure needs. We're going to have serious economic problems ahead of us in the next year. I, you know, I, I think any priorities that are these sort of minor, objectively minor issues, if we're going to have like long debates about those, that's just going to further, further, further erode uh, the public's trust in our government. I, I think, you know, as far as I actually did think the state. Uh, was going to be more competitive than people expected. I you know, wrote this a number of times. Um, it was a bigger margin than I thought it was going to be, frankly, um, partly because it's a conservative state. Like, we have every kind of conservative here. So if you're a conservative who's serious about being conservative, you know, like, you have ample reason not to vote for Trump. So the amount of defectors, um, and we did see Democrat turnout come up too, but it was really the margin error because of defectors, people who cared about the issues, cared about the principles and values they've always said they cared about, who were just at the end of the day going to say, you know, maybe because, you know, it's sort of not a swing state, but just at the end of the day, we're going to say, I'm not going to do this. I can't support this person. Like, my fellow Texans are not collateral damage. Um, I'm against, you know, dismantling NAFTA for no apparent reason. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a tough session. Um, and why, tell me why you think it's going to be a tough session. Per se, because they don't have Washington to beat up anymore? Um, because there's widespread... <laughs> doubt in the leaders. The most credible leader at this point in, of the big three is Joe Strauss. Um, and he will do his best. This is probably his last session. But already last session, looking back at that, um, you know, you have this weird sort of House versus Senate dynamic. And there's this kind of conception on the, you know, in the conservative grassroots that Joe Strauss is the enemy. Um, that by dealing with Democrats at all, he's, he's a traitor to the cause. Um, when in reality, Strauss is, I think, more conservative. Uh, on fiscal issues, uh, and more conservative in the classically liberal sense than uh, Governor Patrick is. So, I mean, we'll have a 
a tighter revenue estimate, which in a way I'm almost happy about because there's less money to fight over. Um, but we'll see this sort of personalized uh, politics where, you know, if, if the House is trying to stand against an effort to scale back or repeal in-state tuition, that it'll be cast as, oh, Joe Strauss, the rhino, it's squish, you know? When in reality, in-state tuition has been good for Texas. It doesn't cost us anything. It's, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's not a, it's just a smart thing to do for our workforce. It was smart when Governor Perry signed it in 2001, so. I want to get a sense from you all. Let's talk about our current state leaders and who might end up in Washington in a potential Trump administration. Uh, let's start with let's start with Cruz. Obviously, a very vocal opponent of Trump. He's currently probably not on Trump's best friend list. He has been talked about as a potential Supreme Court appointee. Where do you think Cruz is going to end up? Is there a slot for him? Truly don't know. Truly, truly don't know. Well, there was just a report this afternoon that he was in New York and met with the president-elect. Truly don't know. I truly don't. What about uh, what about uh, Rick Perry, who has been very vocal on veterans' issues? I think both Rick Perry and Ted Cruz are too much of a threat to Trump's ego to be cabinet appointees, which is a, you know a shame, perhaps. Um, someone like Rick Perry, I think, would be great at, at DOD uh, or at VA, but I, I think that I mean Trump seems to to really prioritize loyalty, um, and so Sid Miller, perhaps. I mean. <laughs> if they can stop using, uh, yes, inappropriate words oh. for female genitalia. That doesn't matter, though. Why, why would that matter? Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> why would that yeah. matter? It didn't stop him from becoming, you know. Um, yeah. It might be a badge of honor. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, I, Governor Abbott was at the meeting today in New York also with, with Cruz. As, I mean, potentially Governor Abbott could be a SCOTUS pick. Um, but, yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the reasons I loved working for a pair, he's a big, he's a big go big or go home kind of guy. I think Trump would have to offer him something really fantastic. And, and to Erica's point, I don't know if that really fantastic offer would come down. Uh, because, you know, he's had a long political career and a long career in public service. He doesn't need a job in the administration. Um, you know, I, I think probably the two Texans that maybe have the best shot of some role in the administration, well, Don Willett's name was on the list, so you know sure. all reports are Supreme that Court. He, for Supreme Court that Trump is going to pick a name off of that list, um, and then potentially a Michael McCall in a Homeland Security position. I mean, he's term limited out of his chairmanship, so um, you know, there, you know, there there are a lot of really great members of Congress who would, could serve in great capacities. We'll just we'll just see how it plays out. I want to be a little bit uh, self-critical. I mean, how, how did the media, how did the pollsters, how did the pundit class get it so wrong? Oh, we all got it wrong. <laughs> right. How, how did we all get it so I wrong? Got it, I got it less wrong than I think a lot of media did because I've been covering it. For, you know, it's, it's actually, and, and to be fair to everyone else in the media, um, it was like, I think that in Texas we, had, we were better because we've been covering Republican primaries so much. The polling than, was also better here than it was virtually anywhere. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, as Texans, we knew Ted Cruz's record better than the national media did. I mean, I, you know, I went to D.C. in April, I think, and I was talking to some friends who were journalists there, and um, they were, you know, smart, thoughtful, uh, conservative journalists, and they were like, he's the worst. And I was like, you know, I actually can kind of see that. Like, like if, you're, if you've been in D.C. and your sources are all in Congress, <laughs> like, since as a Texan, uh, you know, I, I voted for Ted Cruz, like, three times, like, like specifically to go to D.C. and like cause problems. So I was like, you know, I, I can see why you guys think he's causing problems because that is why we sent him to D.C. to do that. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, of course, a more general problem. There's not very much, I mean, this is a problem for the whole primary. There's not that many journalists who are not based in D.C. and New York or on the coast. Um, so you think about something like Charlie Sykes in Wisconsin, kind of what a voice he was and how important he was because there's not that many of us who are not outside the coastal centers. Um, I think that beyond that, you know, part of the problem is that a lot of, quote, unquote, media elites come from an elite background. They don't have ties to the white working class. Um, there also is, I think, the problem of this sort of, I mean, we keep using the word normalization, maybe it's not the right word, but there's this, I think, effect where if you have cable news on the background of your day-to-day -day life, or you put on Morning Joe and you're making your coffee, then you see this kind of person who has like funny hair and is kind of like a funny 80s caricature, but like is being treated as though he's normal by these adults who are normal, you know? then you're kind of desensitized. You get this like, mental callus. Um, and so you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think when he declares his candidacy that he's as extreme or as kind of voluble and, and strange as he's proven to be because you have this idea that he's a successful businessman. He's got his name on buildings and stuff. Um, 
I don't watch cable. So like, I was like, you guys. Like, this is like, um, but yeah. How, Jason, how were we this surprised? Were you surprised? I'm just going to let him hang here until he answers the question. I'll, I'll add that I was, what I got most wrong was I got white women really wrong, which is the what? white, white women. women. Don't save Jason. Um, yeah. <laughs> save <me. laughs> we had a rough year here, I think. But, yeah. um, no, you know, I am a white woman, and so I, I think that if you look at the exit polls, like, a majority of white men voted for Trump, a majority, a smaller majority of white women voted for Trump. In states like Wisconsin, this is huge, right? Um, I think I thought that white women would have the same reaction to Trump's misogyny, at least, that women of color. I, you know, I think part of it, it was such a, an off-the-wall campaign. He didn't do any of the things that you're told and you grow up thinking that you have to do in order to win. A state rep race, much less the presidency, there was no grassroots organization. There was no, you know, super cool Obama-style Silicon Valley, you know, skunk works coming up with cool technology to help, you know. And, and so I think that all kind of lulled us into a, a sense of this isn't a real campaign. I, I, well, let me speak, that's how I felt, that this wasn't really real, this was, uh, it, this was a force of personality thing, and that without those fundamentals, you just, you can't compete in these states. And I think that's one of the reasons why I got lulled into the, well, of course Hillary's going to win narrative. Um, that it just, it, everything I've learned and grew up in politics doing, he did none of it and still managed to win a very convincing victory. I like to think that there's a basic uh, feeling amongst the American people that when they're disrespected, they strike back. I remember with uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, he had Operation Chaos, where he wanted to rig, I guess you could say, the Democrat primary, Democratic primary. You could say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he wanted to rig it, and he asked voters to vote for Obama, right, over Hillary. And we got Obama, and, and he won, and he, Eight years, and I feel like the media this time, same thing with Trump. You know, uh, they wanted to push him, and he, uh, there's a figure out there, two billion dollars in earned media. You know, and I think a lot of people out there were like, you know, I, I think Americans, they, at the end of the day, uh, they they know when something's being uh, pushed and they're being trolled, sort of, and they strike back. And I was asked about, you know, what what's happening with American democracy. I think all the people I've seen come from the Trump camp. Good people. I mean, uh, some of them, like 20%, maybe I can say, I don't agree on their extreme views, but a lot of them are just normal guys who have been out of the loop when it comes to politics, and they finally got involved, and they're just like, yeah, I'm gonna go with Trump. You know, it's like, just, yeah, this guy, bait, just uh, in the instinct, you know, and these guys have been out of the game. They don't, they don't go to precinct chair conventions or con state yeah. conventions. Uh, they're not listening to talk radio all the time, uh, these are just normal people who have to pay bills and are in, you know, in debt. And what I've noticed is, uh, you know, when, when they feel like they're being played, they're, they will speak up. And, you know, I, I agree with that. And I think also there's so few people who can credibly, uh, you know, push back against that. So one thing that was really kind of poignant covering the primary was that if you look at the states that Trump lost, it's like Ohio, which is, had its, its governor running and campaigning as if Ohio is the most important state imaginable, you, you know, Utah, which has you know, very strong, tight-knit Mormon communities and had Mitt Romney come out and say, uh, you know, I'm going to vote for Ted Cruz, and then you know, about 50 points. Um, you have, of course, Texas, Cruz's home state, Oklahoma, which is adjacent to Texas. Um, all the caucus states, the I mean, Cruz won all of them besides Minnesota, which Rubio won. So it's like anywhere there was some, some, somebody who was there to kind of cut through the noise, to say, I'm your neighbor, I'm your governor, I'm your friend, I care about you, I've cared about you since before Trump showed up, uh, I'm not lying to you, I'm not a cable news person, um, I'm not somebody you can easily just dismiss as media or the establishment or a backer of Jeb. Like, it, when there's somebody who's saying, credibly, with earned trust, I'm, I'm not gonna go for that, you shouldn't either, that's when Trump was stopped. And so, it's sad that there weren't more states that had such leaders. The reason I pause is because I, I want to be very careful because I remember the morning after 2012. I was, it was like 7 in the morning and I had a horrible headache. And I really do believe it was a sinus infection. <laughs> but I mean really like bad, like headache like I've never had before and I was sitting on a panel 
and it was 7 a.m. the morning after. What just happened? And I could, I could literally hear the pulse in my head. I was hurting so bad, and so I'm just trying to make it through this. And even in that fog, I was like, wait a second, the, the guy who sort of does what I do, who's a Democrat, and uh, this journalist, they just said the exact same thing, but like in the exact same way. And, and it was just like, boom, the narrative is set, and then the autopsy comes out, and there's nothing wrong with this. It's natural. When we look at, a, at, at, at particularly in politics, a process and say, well, what went wrong, or why were we surprised? The look back analysis tends to be more of a, a, an act of persuasion to impact it next time to conform to the things that I want. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think that's important to say. And it's an important part, in my opinion, of what happened this time. In my opinion, while all, everything that, that, that he mentioned earlier uh, is, is spot on and true about the challenges that the Republican Party faces among the Hispanic community, many other communities. All of those things are true. They're not necessarily, in a given year, the reason for victory or defeat. And they can be true while other things are true. All of that to say, think about the amount of time and energy that then was distributed through all channels. But most importantly, if you're a Republican primary voter, you pretty much get your information from one place, and that's Fox News, as to why we lost in 2012. And none of them mentioned the truth. We lost because he was always going to win re-election, given GDP, given his approval, given the fact that when the American people elect someone, it's almost always an eight-year contract. But we were told all of these other reasons, and so you talk about being punked or trolled. There was some of that reaction. You're told over and over and over again, you have to vote for someone. The only way you can win the presidency, take an issue, is to be for you know, amnesty, and not to get into debate about what that means, but I'm just using it you know, as an example. And so there was so much pent up demand for a victory, demand to, you know, to, to undo these policies, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I saw this in focus groups where there were very, I remember this, this, this one lady uh, from Iowa who was, I would say, a constitutional conservative. And she, at, through, the, through the session, I, I'm just taking notes, I was learning like a lot about how to talk about things, and then it got to the very end. And the, the panelists asked the, the participants, well, do you think that an actual conservative can win? And to a person, this is in Iowa, they all said, no, can't happen. I, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I know, you know, a classic liberal or a constitutional conservative. Those are the ideals we need put into action, but we can't do it. We're a minority. And so fast forward to the end. The last poll we took in Wisconsin, 60, mid-60s, 60 60-something 60 percent of those who cast a ballot for Ted Cruz said they thought that Donald Trump would win the nomination. And peop, just all this to say people just wanted to win. And all they've seen from a partisan perspective, and much more, by the way, but from a partisan perspective, we haven't won. We've got to win. Here's this media mogul. And towards the end of the process, in the primary, at least everybody said he's going to win. And that became reality. I agree with the comments that have been made about why were we surprised. Some of us just don't. As I said earlier, I'm not okay with this. You know, but all of that, I believe it started in 2012 and all of those streams of information, and you wake up and here you are. Right. Well, we're about to open it up to questions, but I just want each of you in a phrase, what would you say to your Democratic friends who are um, feeling you know, grave despair right now, not just sort of that Hillary lost, but at this idea that sort of you know, white nationalism has sort of risen to the surface as this toxic element of this campaign. You've got somebody like Bannon who's going to be in the White House. What do you say to your despairing Democratic friends? <laughs> I, I'm assuming you have some. 
that was bad to be my response. Yeah. Right, so this is a, yeah, this is, uh, I actually, there were President Obama's comments, I believe, in Greece, was it yesterday? There were many things he said that had me scratching my head, but there was one thing that he said that I thought was very important, and it was, as he often does, just kind of looks back and talks about it from this higher level, and I think in this way it was appropriate. He said, you know, history takes many twists and many turns, and it's important for us to remember that. Uh, beyond that, uh, I, I absolutely believe, in conjunct history takes many twists and turns, but love does prevail over hate. It absolutely does. Uh, I wouldn't want to offer any advice that I actually think is good on what they're doing wrong in reaction, but I, I, I do believe that. And I would, I would hope that they would uh, take some comfort in that there have been many people throughout this process who have gone against their own financial interests. They're, they've put their reputations on the line to stand up on those particular issues and say, I'm not with that, I'm not for that, that is not okay. It, it, because it's not. Anybody else? I mean, I'd say our country is bigger than one person. You know, this, this is not dissimilar to conservatives who, you know, were, were thought of what the world was coming in when Obama was elected president. I mean, the country is bigger than one person, the institution is bigger than one person, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of checks and balances in the system that I, I got to think that at the end of the day, anything that is, there's not a system set up for really crazy policies to proceed. And I, I personally take comfort in that. I would say, uh, out of, you know, out of, in my opinion, uh, here in the United States, out of conflict and competition comes growth. It's good to have two parties that are healthy and competitive and, and put together good ideas and we battle it out. And I would recommend to Democrat friends is uh, look at what happened with, with the election and, and encourage your party to be more transparent. I, what I'm talking about is uh, Hillary, I think one of the emails that came out where she said she had, um, I don't know if I'm phrasing it right, but I think she spoke at, uh, with some bankers or something in Brazil and she said, there's something you present to the public and then there's this private sort of this noble lie. Uh, you know, we're ha I think the Republican Party has the same issue in terms of conservatism, uh, you know, the noble lie, classical liberal thing. You know, I, look at the liberty movement, right? That I'm, I, I'm a part of as well. I feel like there's a yearning for transparency and just being real and being true with people about how things work and what's really going on. And I think both parties are getting to that point. So I think Hillary got hit a lot because of this, what she presented to the people and what was really going on. And it was all pulled back because of WikiLeaks. I would recommend to Democratic friends is make your party more transparent, make it more for the people. And, uh, you know, and we'll do, we'll do the same on our end. Um, well, I've been saying to my friends who are upset that it's, it's still our country, we all still belong here, um, that I'll, I'll be here, I'll still be fighting for it, um, and with my friends and with my family. And uh, in Texas, I've said to my friends that I think in 2018, there, there are going to be candidates, there are going to be some good candidates, um, and I think some of them can win. Um, so in this state, at least, I think especially in this state, because the things we saw in the Rust Belt, the upper Midwest states, Ohio, I mean, those states might not change, but we actually can change. And it could be important that we change by 2018, um, because by 2020, who knows where we'll be. Um, so. Um, Thank you. All right, we're going to open it up to questions. Yes, sir. I want to talk about the future of the Texas kids. Use that mic, please. And uh, questions, not comments, go. Okay, I want to talk about the future of Texas kids. Just recently, a report, early child intervention cuts are harming children. Kids with disabilities are losing access to their therapists due to the budget cuts. The Texas Education Agency has been found to be conducting a practice to effectively cap kids going to special education far below the national average, and the CPS is in chaos. Are we looking at, and, and every one of these things can be traced back to rep Republican-led appropriations decisions. What's up in next session? Are we going to cut more franchise taxes or try to restore <clears throat> some of the things and invest in these kids? Well, I think the leadership has already made CPS reform and adding additional funding to CPS a priority. 
I think that's, uh, a, that it will undoubtedly be done. It is the hardest issue to deal with. It's the hardest issue I had to deal with when I was in government because the only, the real solution to that problem is parents loving their children um, and get, government can't mandate that. But, but uh, that's been made clear as a priority. Um, you've got Strauss already talking about the, the special ed issues. I mean, it is, next session is going to be a difficult session because there will be a tight budget circumstance, you know. And I, in, in many respects, it's easier to write a budget when you don't have a lot of money. But <laughs> it is, um, and that was my experience in the legislature, working with the legislature. Um, but what's going to make this session harder is that you've, not only do you have that difficult budget situation, you have these very weighty issues on top of them as well, like school finance, like education reform, like CPS reform. And that's going to be competing for oxygen with some of these uh, more social conservative issues, like a revisiting of the voter ID bill, a revisiting of House Bill 2, um, the bathroom. bathroom issue. I mean, we could go on and on. So um, I think those are all going to be priorities. And my experience has been that you know, in, in tough budget cycles, the lawmakers do a much better job of divvying up the funds. And so I am, I am cautiously optimistic on those issues that have already been identified that, um, that there will be progress made. Yes, yes sir. Uh, talking about the legislature and the problems the Republican Party has of trying to reach out and to minority groups, to the urban voter, et cetera. How do you do that when your leadership still, as was made very clear yesterday in Governor Patrick's 10 priorities, is still playing to that very, very, very small minority in the Republican primary and not to the general voter and not to the, to the voters at large, is, is, is running again on 10 priorities, and he's not talking about CPS, he wasn't talking about education reform, he's talking about vouchers. None of his things, he was talking about windstorm tart reform, et cetera. None of the issues that he's raised are the type things that reach out to that urban voter or to that Hispanic voter. So how, how does the Republican Party then make inroads with any of those communities, um, you know, given that, those kinds of priorities? Uh, I think it's sort of the tragedy of the commons where uh, everybody knows the Growth and Opportunity Project autopsy report did that with Ryan sat down with him. Everybody knows the, the issue. Every, immigration is a problem. Everybody knows the problem with Hispanic outreach. The problem is who's going to do it? Who's going to do the outreach? If you look at candidates who run for office, they have to focus on winning their race. If you look at uh, legislators, they got to represent their districts. If you look at the party mechanism itself, they got to raise money and... Uh, Throw conventions. So, who's, who, who are the guys that do the actual outreach, or who who brings in new voters? Uh, who you know? That's really the issue with the Republican Party. Is everybody knows we got to reach the Hispanic community, but institutionally, I don't know. If there's anybody out there or a machine or a mechanism that can do it. We're going to need the donor class to step up and just do it from an altruistic standpoint, or find a, another reason. But uh, you know, I don't. I don't expect Dan Patrick to be that guy. You know, uh, when Rick Perry was in office. We, I was stunned when, he would, when SB 1070 hit in Arizona and Rick Perry stood in front of the, uh, the TV and said, it's not going to happen in Texas. I was like, awesome, because now I can go to an Univision and I can say, well, you know what, uh, Rick Perry is our leader and he's speaking for our Republican Party, no matter what Steve King says or Sheriff Joe Arpaio. That was awesome, and we were able to make inroads. We need more of that, people who are willing to risk political capital and just look at the future uh, but, you know, I, I don't know if Dan Patrick's that guy, but I know we, Rick Perry was, and uh, we really appreciate that. Yes, uh, sir, in the, I think you're wearing a pink shirt. <laughs> Red, something like that. Hey, guys. Um, so my question is kind of about, uh, I think the whole point of this was kind of to come and talk about a party in disarray after their, their election loss. We spent a lot of time talking about the Republican Party here, but no talk about sort of where the Democratic Party goes uh, after this. We saw, you know, That'll be Hillary, next week. Hillary get a ball. <laughs> but I just want to kind of see, uh, does anyone have an opinion about kind of what, you know, who leads, that, who leads that party going forward? What does it look like? Does it move one way or the other? Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of, that's the big surprise. It's, it's sort of almost as much 
turned upside down as uh, people sort of expected the Republican Party to be, I think, at this point. Who wants to take that one? Yep. Well, I'll just comment in, in kind of also in response. If, if the questions and the issues you laid out, I didn't see Governor Patrick's 10 points yesterday, but the piece where you said, if, the, if this is true, I'll just give you this, that in your opinion, you know, it's all tailored to a very small you know, population. So I think, put another way, you're saying activist within the Republican Party. So the same is true for the Democrat Party. And I think that that is their major issue go forward, particularly when they went into this election with a firm belief that we have a blue wall. And why do we have this blue wall? And the early moves that I see them making, there doesn't appear to be a course change at all. I mean, I, when I'm out of Texas, I talk about you know, how amazing it is and how encouraging and how healthy it is that I know actual elected Democrats in Texas who work with Republicans and vice versa. And it's rare that the, the end product is not better, right? You can believe this or not, think I'm crazy. There ain't a lot of that in Washington, D.C. And it's not just on one side. And, and I think go forward for the Democrats, I mean, you know, they accomplished a lot, things that I disagree with, I assume we all disagree with, but you look at the rhetoric, the, the, the organizing, and unless you fit into a certain category, and all of those categories are great, but it's just, it's a, it's a message, ironically, about we're hope and the future and open to everyone, but there's, there sure seems to be a lot of exclusion. Uh, and, and if they, I, th I think the best advice they could take would be go back to James Carville, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, I think in Texas, it's weird. When they make gains, they don't seem to capitalize on those gains in presidential years and in, in capitalize it into non-gubernatorial year elections. It's so weird. It's like there's just been this cycle that, thank God, they haven't figured out that, that you know, we're just going to put all, put all of our chits on some, you know, cultural or media phenomenon to this is going to be the person to lead our party out of the doldrums. It was the dream team in 2002. Last cycle, it was Wendy Davis. You know, this time, I know I'm throwing it way back. Um, you know, Wendy Davis, and, you know, now it's the Castro brothers. It's like this, like, it's like they, they want to pin it all on personalities, but there's really no <laughs> structural, um, they're not building building the foundation for long-term success. So, I mean, you know, I know I'm sort of contradicting myself because I just said earlier, 2018 could be their year. They could elect somebody. Um, but, God, they make it hard for themselves. I don't know who that is because, you know, I turned on the radio last week driving down to Corpus Christi, and it's all about, is Wendy Davis going to run against Ted Cruz? <laughs> I mean, is, the, is the memory that, that short? It'll probably be a Castro brother. Oh, yeah, it'll probably be a Castro brother. <laughs> yeah. Do I have any women in the audience who have their hands up? Yes, ma'am, right there. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, so um, the Republican Party has long criticized the Democratic Party for running on identity politics. Do you think what Donald Trump did was running on identity politics, <coughs> and do you think the future of the GOP will try to capitalize on the white vote? Uh, yes. Uh I think he did run ran on identity politics, and it is uh, it's a classical liberal conservative. I was disappointed by that. Uh, you know, I, usually someone like me in my position would just not say anything because Trump just won. But I think if we're going to talk about the future of the GOP, we got to learn, and but especially in Texas, uh, I do believe that the first, and again, I'll, I'll do respect to Jason. I, I just speak what what I what I look at and what I observe. Uh, I believe Ted Cruz was one of the first guys to start the trend. I uh, remember in D.C. There, uh, there was a march for jobs where he had African-American pastors who uh, were out there, and he told them that uh, illegal immigrants were taking the jobs of young black uh, Americans. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Cato Institute guy. I'm a, you, know, look, you look at all the data, and it, that's, that's unproven, but it's a powerful weapon when you do divide by class. Uh, I was really uh, sad to see my party, conservative women, go that route this time. Uh, you know, but Donald Trump's not a conservative. You know, he's a pure political animal that did what he had to do. He's a businessman. It was a vehicle. That's the only hope I could come up with, you know, that he, he was not a true conservative that participated in that type of politics. 
Uh, but I do see Paul Ryan out there. I see uh, he was a Jack, he's a Jack Kemp guy. To me, he's a young guy. He's part of that new movement. Uh, look at Mike Lee, uh, uh, Ben Sass. You know, these are guys that are stepping up and really pushing the party towards what should be, uh, to me, the standard. And I think you're going to, I believe, just looking at how things are playing out from a spectator uh, standpoint, I think uh, you're going to see them influence uh, Trump, uh, you know, and I think we're going to be surprised, uh, you know, even though he engaged in a lot of rhetoric that was horrible, I think we're going to be surprised as to what he's going to do in the next 18 months. Take one more. Yes, Paul Steckler in the back there. Can you stand up, please, so we can hear you? Curious about the coming uh, internal battles that might happen among the leadership. Erica, you said that uh, Strauss is going to be probably this will be his last speaker time. I've heard interesting rumors, maybe they're silly, about McCall uh, perhaps uh, challenging Cruz in a senatorial primary. And are there other primary challenges likely to happen uh, before the 2018 race among the Republican candidates? Are there other likely primary challenges? Um, I would say that Governor Patrick's been raising enough money to suggest that he's going to run for either re-election or for a higher state office in 2018. Um, Is there something above the kind of governor? <laughs> 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 he has said he doesn't want to run for governor. Well, he's then maybe he's raising money for re-elect, but there's there's you know he can't transfer those funds to a Senate campaign, so I don't think it's going to be a primary challenge to to Cruz. Um, but I think that I don't think we'll see a a challenge to Strauss as speaker, as we saw last time. Um, I mean, I suppose if, if Sid Miller is still there, then somebody might actually <laughs> primary him. There has been a lot of talk about yeah, there'll be a, oh, there'll Sid be a primary. Miller. And actually, you know, I think there might be a primary challenge to Ken Paxton if General Paxton is still the AG. Mm -hmm. I think that depends on what happens in his court case. Yeah, and so that, I mean, if, if he's gone, then there won't be, but I, I think if he's still there, I've talked to some very, very frustrated conservatives who do not think that it's good to have a guy under indictment be the attorney general. Is Cruz anticipating a primary challenge? Has he had any conversations with McCall about this? Not to my knowledge. Uh, but absolutely, you should always expect a challenge. And it's cliche as that sounds, it's true. I mean, and, but, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but to yeah. Ted Cruz is great. He did something that was really hard. And he, he wanted to be the president, and he came so close to it, and it didn't happen, OK? And he came back to Texas. He must have been exhausted after that presidential. That was a, a long presidential cycle. He came back to Texas, and he started running around the state like he was running, like he was on the ballot this time. And well, he, he sort of was on the ballot. I mean, he he angered a lot of folks in his party. Uh, he, the, neither here nor there. He wasn't on the ballot this time. He's on the ballot in two years, and maybe that's why he did it. Maybe not. But to his credit, he, he did it. Not a lot of people did that. And I think that's the type of kind of attitude we need to have in the Republican primary or the Republican Party going forward, that you, you shouldn't just run when you're on cycle. I mean, I read some article where he was in some, like, sugar land. He was, I, what was, he it was like, basically election? tipping cows in West yeah. Texas. I mean, yeah. that is really hard to do after going through a really yeah. tough and being at the highest peak of politics right. and to come back and do that. And, um, yeah. you know, that's the type of thing that all these guys and women who are in leadership in this party should be doing in Texas because I don't think we can take it for granted. You better be careful. Sounds like Deirdre wants to work for Ted. Uh, I'm out of politics. Sure <laughs> all right, well, well, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, there are gonna be uh, cocktails and appetizers following this, but thank you all so much for joining us. We, and thanks so much to our great panelists. Thank you. Thank you.